my concern is that they're going to be hurting themselves economically, not helping the artist as much as they think they are. I don't think this is going to last very long. I don't think it's going to pass. A lot of people don't think it's going to pass. But then again, I didn't think President Trump would be in office. All right. So the European Union trilogue thing is, uh, I don't want to say over. I think the trilogue is finished, though. And what we have here is the final text of the copyright directive. Now, it's called a directive because concepts of federalism, uh, you guys don't call it federalization or federalism, but that's, that's more or less what the concept is. You have a number of European states that we would call countries or member countries, and those member states are part of a federalized civilization or federalized government that takes some power away from the states and decides things uniformly for the entire union. And then the way, if I understand this correctly, because I am not myself a citizen of the European Union, um, and I'm not experienced with this, but uh, the European Union Parliament will make a new law in the form of a directive, and then the member states have to implement their version of the law that complies with that directive. So what we are looking at is the directive part that will come from the Council of the European Union, the Parliament, and the—there's one more— Somebody jump in with the third one there. And that's what makes up the trilogue. And then they voted on this. They vote this through. And now the actual European Parliament, every MEP, member of European Parliament, will vote on this sometime near the end of March, beginning of April of this year, 2019. So as we made a video last week, now is the time to be concerned about Article 11, Article 13, and the rest of this. There is more to this than just Article 11, Article 13. Now, this is very long, and we're not going to go over all of it today. And this is more or less, this is the format that it's in. On the left here, we have the original commission proposal from 2016. Then we have the European Parliament text from 2018. Then we have the Council of the European Union text from whatever the 9,134th day of 2018 was. And then we have a possible compromise solution. This is the more or less final text on the right here. And so you can go through and sort of row by row, line by line, see what has changed between the four versions of this text. And we thought, eh, we could try to go through a couple pages of this, but there are 260 pages like this. Meanwhile, this, I believe, is the actual text, not or, or without all of the change log or... or previous versions listed next to it. And so I thought maybe we could just try going through this a little bit and see what is it that your members of European Parliament have to go through if they're going to try and understand this 80 pages of new copyright law by the end of March. Having regard to the Treaty of the Functioning of the EU, having regard to the proposal from the European Commission, etc., etc., lots of flourishing language. The treaty provides for the establishment of an internal market and the institution of a system ensuring that competition in the internal market is not distorted, harmonization of the laws of member states on copyright and related, related rights should contribute further to the achievement of these objectives. The directives have been adopted in an area of copyright and related rights contribute to the functioning of the internal market. I'm assuming they're talking about the importance of the uh, economics of the European Union. Rapid technological developments continue to transform the way works and other subject matter are created, produced, distributed, exploited, new business models. This looks like kind of a statement of intent. And some of this is important when you go to interpret a law like this. If something has come up that's vague or ambiguous, or you, would, you would need to look at the legislative intent. 
The directive is based upon and complements rules laid down in the directives currently in force in this area, in particular Directive 96.9EC, Directive 2031EC, Directive 2001.29EC, 2006.115EC, 2009.24EC. So this is changing a bunch of laws, 2012.28EU and 2014.26EU. In the fields of research, innovation, education, preservation of cultural heritage, digital technologies permit new types of uses that are not clearly covered by current union rules, etc. So this looks like something that would actually be ripe for me to go through with a highlighter and try to highlight exactly which parts we need to cover rather than try to do this on stream in front of you right now. Although we are already 10% of the way through it. This part does seem like a summary. Maybe this is the directive part of it, but this is written a lot like someone who's brainstorming information regarding the future and ongoing use of out-of-commerce works and other subject matter by cultural heritage institutions on the basis of this directive and the arrangements in place for all rights holders to exclude the application of licenses or of the exception or limitation to their works should be adequately publicized both before and during the use under a license or the exception or limitation as appropriate. This is not written as a law so far. And it generally won't be written as a law because it needs to, it, it's up to each member country to write the law. Right. So it's describing what the law should accomplish. That seems terribly inefficient to me, because if there needed to be a uniform law, then why would you issue a directive to make your own version of a uniform law? To put it slightly simple, for as far as you can put anything in Europe simple, it's easier to put out a directive and have countries have their own say in how they want to implement the law than make an actual European law because anyone can veto it. So it will take a lot longer to make a proper law regarding this sensitive topic. So this okay. will be the best bet to get any kind of legislation in place. Also, I quickly sent you a DM with a joint statement from the Netherlands, Poland, and three other countries. Okay, let's open that Italy, up. Italy, Finland, and Luxembourg. Statement of Netherlands, Luxembourg, Poland, Italy, Finland. Hmm. The objectives of this directive were to enhance the good functioning of the internal market and to stimulate innovation, creativity, investment, and production of new content also in the digital environment. The signatories support these objectives. Digital technologies have radically changed the way content is produced, distributed, and accessed. The legislative framework needs to reflect and guide these changes. However, in our view, the final text of the directive fails to deliver adequately on the above-mentioned aims. We believe that the directive in its current form is a step back for the digital single market rather than a step forward. Most notably, we regret that the directive does not strike a balance between the protection of rights holders and the interests of EU citizens and companies. It therefore risks to hinder innovation rather than promote it and to have a negative impact on the competitiveness of the European digital single market. Furthermore, we feel that the directive lacks legal clarity, will lead to legal uncertainty for many stakeholders concerned, and may encroach upon EU citizens' rights. We therefore cannot express our consent with the proposed text of the directive. Seems pretty good to me. Um, let's see. Towards the end of this, there, is, there was a definition section. There is, a te there is article three. Okay, so here we get into an actual article. Uh, this is the text on data mining. Member states shall provide for an exception of rights for reproductions and extractions made by research organizations and cultural heritage institutions. So I'm going to skip data mining for now because we're most interested in the ones called Article 11 and 13, if these are the same numbers. Preservation of cultural heritage, common provisions, use of out-of-commerce works by cultural heritage institutions. We'll go over all of this separately. Publicity measures, stakeholder dialogue, collective licensing with extended ex effect. Let's see what this is. Member states may, be, may, be, may provide, as far as use within their national territory is concerned, in accordance with mandates from rights holders 
enters into a licensing agreement for the exploitation of works or other subject matter, such an agreement may be extended to apply to the rights of right holders who have not authorized that collective management organizations represent them. Okay, so there's somehow an extending of, of rights from consenting right hold, rights holders to non-consenting rights holders. That'll be worth a read later. Here we go. Article 11. Protection of press publications concerning online uses. Member states shall provide publishers of press publications established in a, me in a member state with the rights provided for in Article 2 and Article 3.2 of the Directive 2001-29-EC for the online use of their press publications by Information Society service providers. These rights shall not apply to private or non-commercial uses of press publications carried out by individual users. The protection granted under the first subparagraph shall not apply to acts of hyperlinking. I'm guessing that means hyperlinking alone. The rights referred to in the first paragraph shall not apply in respect of uses of individual words or, quote, very short extracts of a press publication. Again, there's no further definition, at least in this article, of what a very short extract is. If I could be pedantic for a moment and just search for very short extract, I do not see that use anywhere in this. It is not defined anywhere in this document, including in the definitions section of what a very short extract is. So it looks seems like individual member states get to decide how much a very short extract is. The rights referred to in paragraph one shall leave intact and shall in no way affect any rights provided for in union law to other to authors or other rights holders in respect of the works and other subject matter incorporated in a press publication. The rights referred to in paragraph one may not be invoked against those authors and other rights holders and in particular may not deprive them of their right to exploit their works and other subject matter independently from the press publication which they are incorporated. When a work or other subject matter is incorporated in a press publication on the basis of a non-exclusive license, the rights referred to in paragraph one may not be invoked to prohibit the use by other authorized users. Uh, yeah, this is this is super vague there. Let's see. It applies other articles shall expire two years after the press publication. Member states shall provide that authors of the works incorporated in a press publication receive an appropriate share of the revenues that press publishers receive for the use of their press publications by information society service providers. That also seems unnecessarily vague. Article 12. Claims to fair compensation. Member states may provide that where an author has transferred or licensed a right to a publisher, such a transfer or license constitutes a sufficient legal basis for the publisher to be entitled to a share of the compensation for the uses of the work made under an exception or limitation. The first part. Okay, that's fine. Article 13. Member states shall provide that an online content sharing provider, sharing service provider, performs an act of communication to the public or an act of making available to the public for the purpose of this directive when it gives the public access to copyright protected works or other protected subject matter uploaded by its users. An online content sharing service provider shall therefore obtain an authorization from the rights holders for instance, by concluding a license agreement in order to communicate or make available to the public works or other subject matter. So there it is. That is exactly what we feared. Uh, that says that someone who is an online content service sharing service provider must get copyright license agreements for works that their users upload. This is completely different than the safe harbor provision that receives so much hate in U.S. law, but if you follow it through and understand why, YouTube has to coldly enforce safe harbor law. It's so that they stay in their safe harbor, and so this doesn't happen where a provider is suddenly liable for the uploads of their users. 
Part two says member states shall provide that when an authorization has been obtained, including via license agreement by an online content sharing service provider, this authorization shall also cover acts carried out by users of the services falling within Article three of Directive 2001-29 AC when they are not acting on a commercial basis. I don't know what that directive is. We'll have to look that up further. When an online content sharing service provider performs an act of communication to the public or act of making available to the public under conditions established this directive limitation liability shall not apply to situations covered by this article uh okay so that basically removes safe harbor liability or protection should i say it removes safe harbor protection from anyone falling within this act if no authorization is granted online content sharing service providers shall be liable for unauthorized acts of communication to the public of copyrighted protected works unless the service provider demonstrates that they have made the best efforts to obtain an authorization. So that's shifting the burden to the service provider for every single copyrighted work that they have to make their best efforts. And it's going to be a fight between whether a tech company thinks they've made the best technological effort or some politician thinks that they haven't made the best technological or otherwise effort and not disjunctive but conjunctive and made in accordance with high industry standards of professional diligence best efforts to ensure the unavailability of specific works and other subject matter for which the right holders have provided the service providers with the relevant and necessary information and in any event acted expeditiously upon receiving a sufficiently substantiated notice by rights holders to remove from their websites or disable access to the notified works and subject matters made best efforts to prevent future uploads so at least there's that book and that if they have acted expeditiously in removing a work that's been asked to be removed, then they're at least not liable for that. But this does this is written in the conjunctive here. So if no authorization is granted and they've made best efforts to obtain authorization and they've used high standards of professional diligence and they removed the work when asked, then they are protected. And they need to do this for every single copyrighted work that their users might upload. Does anyone see a problem with this? I do. I'm going to raise my hand here. In determining whether the service has complied with its obligations under paragraph four and in light of the principle of proportionality, the following should, among others, be taken into account. The type, the audience, the size of services, the availability of suitable effective means and costs for service providers. The, the problem I have with laws like this is it says you got to do this unless we, the politicians, agree that it was hard for you. It's not written in the opposite. It should be written, when the technology is available, you know, somebody, you know, the Librarian of Congress you know, or, the, or the Register of Copyrights in the U.S. would do this. They would say, okay, this technology is now available, to do, so we're no longer going to have an exception for this under copyright law or something like that. At least that's the opposite of this. This is more so saying, you guys have a problem unless we later on agree that maybe it was hard for you. I don't like that. That requires, and this is for every single copyrighted work. Could you imagine Google? Could you imagine yourself? Could you imagine Leonard French having to look up every single copyrighted work that could possibly have been posted to his Discord channel and having to buy licenses for each and every single copyrighted work? It's a radical idea. Like, it'd be, it'd be really cool to be an artist and be finally getting compensated for all these mimetic uses of your work, for all these, you know, Reddit posts and Tumblr posts and Twitter posts and all that. However, though, it's going to shut down those platforms in a sense, because none of those platforms are going to be able to comply with this at that level. I don't think the people who wrote this have any understanding of how big the internet is compared to how few the people are at Google who are actually running any one part of it. I'm not defending Google. I'm saying I don't think it's going to happen this quickly. It needs to be more, it needs to be more specifically tailored to use the U.S. standard. Let's just finish uh, Article 13 a little bit here. Member states shall provide that when new online content sharing service providers whose services have been available to the public for less than three years, which have annual turnover below 10 million euros, within the meaning of the commission recommendation, the liability set out in paragraph four are limited to the compliance with point A of paragraph four, which is 
something about allowing states to recognize when businesses are too small. The cooperation between online service providers and rights holders shall not result in the prevention of the availability of works or other subject matter uploaded by users which do not infringe copyright. Which means that every one of these service providers needs to identify the copyright status of every single work. We have a tremendous orphaned works problem that we talk about at our law conferences all the time, and this appears to have completely overlooked that, even though we talk about it all the time. The orphan works problem means, in short, it's not easy to tell when a copyrighted work is owned properly, licensed properly, whether it was copyrighted properly, whether it's still on copyright, and this problem gets gets more and more difficult the farther and farther in time you get from the original publication of the copyright. For example, you may remember that Warner Chapel thought it owned Happy Birthday, and it did not. Can you imagine having to have that fight, which took months and cost thousands of dollars, over every single copyrighted work that wasn't 100% clear, and every single use that's not 100% clear? What happens to every single fair use uh, inquiry now is they have to go through this as well. Yeah, it, it, could, it could make works be a more it could mean that artists are going to be paid more for their works it also means that all of those situations have to now be addressed with a completely new economic regime and if we're talking about trying to preserve the digital single market i have a feeling this is going to upset the digital single market more than it's going to preserve it and i'm i'm just i'm not even i'm not even an interested party here i just love my copyright law and i think something that we saw with um the i believe it's uh the star control game uh, is that, you know, when you have um, parts of the IP are owned by a company and then gets bought by another company, but then that company goes bankrupt. And then, you know, there's, it's very difficult sometimes to trace who now owns what when, when companies no longer exist, when there's no, if the company doesn't exist anymore, there's no representative from that, co from that company to talk to. Yeah. The... So part seven of article 13 says that member states re can require, should require, shall provide that online service providers provide rights holders adequate information on the functioning of the practices referred to in article four or par paragraph four on cooperation. So, so not only that, but Google has to maintain or a service provider has to maintain their uh, a kind of a written statement of their practices and provide it on request to rights holders. Member states shall provide the online service provider puts in place effective and expeditious complaint and redress mechanism. I'm actually okay with that part. I would love to have YouTube be required to address complaints in a specific fashion if there was a law that said, by the way, when you tell people they're in violation of your community guidelines, you have to say what community guideline they, they, they violated and how. I would love that, actually. That wouldn't sound too bad to me. It's, 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 uh, I've called it abusive in the past. I've literally called it the same thing as spousal abuse. When you take your business partner and you say, we're going to take away your money, but we're not going to tell you why. That's abusive to me. Um, and I can't think of anything in this article or any, anything in this law here that's more in line with my personal biases and desires than we should require YouTube to answer those questions with specificity. That's not quite what this says, but that's getting closer. When rights holders request to remove or disable access to their specific works, they shall duly justify the reasons for their requests, etc. So that it goes both ways. The provider has to have a complaint system. The rights holder has to complain with specificity. And as of the date of force of this directive, the commission in cooperation with member states shall organize stakeholder dialogues to discuss best practices. Oh, I don't know that this is a law. I mean, it's it's definitely not. I mean, it's a directive. I know that, but I mean, this doesn't this doesn't even seem to have the specificity necessary to make a law out of it. Quite the opposite. This should be so specific that we know exactly how each member state is going to implement the law and how the digital single market and just the overall economics of the situation will be preserved. This doesn't do any of that. And if the EU was a stock market, I would expect this kind of thing to ding the part of the stock market that deals with creatives and copyright and all that. It doesn't quite work that way, but that's my concern.
my concern is that they're going to be hurting themselves economically, not helping the artists as much as they think they are. I don't think this is going to last very long. I don't think it's going to pass. A lot of people don't think it's going to pass. But then again, I didn't think President Trump would be in office. True. It's a crazy world that we live in. And as John Oliver pointed out during his Brexit talk last Sunday, a lot of voters aren't very well informed and will even admit that to you. And maybe I'm not trying to say that they shouldn't have the right to vote. However, maybe there should be like a generally socially acceptable level of of civil participation before it's acceptable to vote. I don't know. Maybe that's a discussion that we could have. Um, it used to be that only uh, white, wealthy, land-owning, you know, lord-type men were allowed to vote. And I'm not saying that that worked out great either, but we don't seem to be doing a great job by letting just any old Joe or Jane vote, regardless of their knowledge of the issues. I don't know, man. That's a, that's a really tough question, right? Yeah, that's a super I mean, tough question. In a way, I agree to a certain extent. Not like only smart people should vote, but I think the main core of the problem is the education system, in a way. Like, yeah. at least for European issues. I mean, here in modern studies, you will learn very well how the Scottish Parliament works. You were you learn decently well how the British Parliament works, but then the next part, they can basically either pick to the European or American uh, politics, and a lot of schools opt for American politics because it's a lot easier to explain than Europe. So you're basically then starting out having people who are part of a European society not learning how the European Union works. I mean, I never learned that in school in the Netherlands either. I learned everything about the Dutch system. And everything I know about Europe is just because I'm interested in Europe myself and at one point aspired to be an MEP myself. So, But education-wise, a lot of people just don't know how these things work. And I think that should be at least one of the fundamentals to know how your system works from there. Yeah. Apply your feelings, your thoughts, or your opinions on how you want to vote. And I think, you know, voting, yes, it's a right, but it's also a responsibility. And... You know, um, you need to be informed and and know that that's that that's on you. That your vote does make a difference, uh, and you need to be, I guess, aware of how people try to influence you. So when a politician is running a campaign, like they they are crafting it to try to appeal to your emotions they're crafting it uh to put their best foot forward and it's it's not going to be accurate it's not going to be a truthful representation no matter what you know they're going to make promises that they won't fulfill and they're going to say things are simple when they're not because that's that's appealing uh so they're trying to get your votes um sort of relying on the fact that you aren't going to think too deeply on it or that you don't have time to fully investigate all of these things. I mean, it's it's really difficult to try to find a balance. All right. So let us know what you think of that in the comments below. I will be putting out further videos on the topic uh, as we get closer and closer to the actual vote. I do plan on going through the entire thing and kind of highlighting which parts I think are most important and trying to understand sections, because obviously we went over a lot a moment ago and we didn't go over the specific definitions or or how each will play out or what some of those other directives were. And we'll continue to report on that. It will be what it will be. If it happens, we'll cover it. If it doesn't happen, we'll rejoice with you as well. Whatever will be, will be. I don't know the rest of the words. Que sera, sera. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Let me say the outro here and thank all of our Patreon supporters. Uh, this channel mostly, well, especially now with the fifth adpocalypse, this channel exists mostly due to your Patreon support. That money that you give us helps us buy equipment, helps us pay Tactical and Brandon, um, helps offset the time that I spend working on the 
videos. I apologize, last week we didn't have the four videos that I thought because I screwed up the audio and didn't have a chance to reshoot at a very busy week, but that will that's just an anomaly. We expect that this week we'll be back to normal and doing three or four videos at least, no problem. So let's call Nico in here for a visit while I thank our $50 plus supporters on patreon.com slash ljfrench. Uh, for the month of February, thank you very much to Jacob Papenfuss, who I forgot about last week, and I really apologize for that. Thank you to Jonathan Doe, Jonathan Steele, or just John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Andy, Kyle Mudrock, Vera Mentain, Michael Pierce, Terry Crisp, Richard Fournier, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Daniel Perez, and of course, again, Jacob Papenfuss. And all of you are scrolling on the LED panel back there. Uh, we need to do some upgrades. We need to do some things, like a new LED. LED panel, maybe some green screen stuff. I have a short video that I want to write. It's a scripted video or I want to finish writing and uh, and produce with all sorts of visuals and animations on it. So uh, all this is very exciting. I think we still have to finish Cambridge Analytica and still have to finish Justin Rogers video as well. And so I'm looking very much forward to getting all that finished shortly here as we are back to a more normal schedule since I don't have to go to court last Friday or this coming Wednesday and, um, and things are calm down. Anyway, love you all. I will look into Ewan's article about uh, Chinese merchants and how I could take advantage of e-packets. I have a feeling it doesn't apply to me anyway. Lawful Masses sketch comedy is on the horizon. Believe it or not, I do have a local improv troupe that I used to be a part of, and we might be able to hire them as actors to reenact some of the more comedic situations that we find ourselves talking about. Uh, keep that in mind, because I'm not done with this. This is not the this is not the plateau. This is not the final version. This is not my final form of the Lawful Masses. Uh, legal education channel. I want to say YouTube channel, but it's more than just YouTube. Anyway, love you all. Give me a dog. I want a Where's dog. Ilsa, we have a Ilsa. Ilsa on stream. come here, my oh, Ilsa. Time. Ilsa, hop. Ilsa, hop. Yes, you are. You have no hop. You have to come hop. You have to come hop and say hi. No, don't jump on her. Nico, hop. Yes, there you go. Yay. Love you all. Have a great week. We will drop most of these videos this week, assuming that my audio is much better than it was last week. So have a great weekend, everybody. I'll see you in the videos and, and the Discord. Don't forget to join us on Discord as well. Love you. Bye.